Good morning, everyone. Good morning to the folks in New Brunswick. Um, Happy New Year. Glad to have you at the Treasurer's Town Hall. Uh, there are some folks who are on the web, uh, and I think we have a, a chat room or a chat function available there through that if you have questions uh, as we go along. We have uh, two primary topics today, and then we can open up for general questions. Uh, Jason McDonald, our Chief Investment Officer, will be talking about the endowment office and the investments uh, for the long-term investment pool, the universities, and then Ernie DeSandro will be talking about the finance, data analytics, and reporting project and ongoing efforts in that area, which have been really uh, crucial in the last uh, couple of months. So uh, without further ado, i would turn it over to Jason. Hi, everybody. Um, cameras are everywhere. So. <laughs> um, thanks for having me. I'm going to try to get off this page as soon as possible because I hate that picture. Um, uh, I joined the university about two and a half years ago. And um, first time we've had staff uh, here at the uh, at the school, uh, building out an endowment office. Prior to uh, my me joining, we had a consultant uh, that reported right to the Joint Investment Committee. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about what we've done in those two and a half years and, and uh, the kind of things we're trying to change um, and try to uh, and grow the endowment, but also make people understand what the endowment does and how that supports the rest of the university. So. There, there's me again. Um, so before I get into who we are, <clears throat> one of the things I think is uh, really important is when I first joined, um, it seemed to me that a lot of folks throughout the university, probably a lot of people in this room, uh, knows what the endowment is and what we're doing here. But um, as we go through these questions, who, what, why, and how, uh, not a lot of folks throughout the university could answer any of those questions. So um, who are we? We're responsible for the investment management of all the endowment assets. The Rutgers University Foundation raises money and they send it to us and we, um, we, we invest that money for, for the long term. Um, we're governed uh, by the Joint Committee on Investments, which is um, a subset of the Board of Governors and the Board of Trustees. And um, that's who we are. Right today on staff, it's myself and, uh, and op Head of Operations, Lou Kish, and we have about four interns. What, what is the endowment? The endowment is a, a, a pool of assets. It's actually about 2,500 individual endowment funds created by donors to um, help pay for scholarships, endowed chairs, et cetera. And uh, we pay out of the endowment about 4% on an annual basis to help support all those individual endowments. Um, the way we think about it at the endowment office is um, just as one pool, not those individual 2,500. The uh, controller's office uh, with, our, with our help um, administers uh, those, but from an investment purpose, um, we try to think about it as one, one pool. The endowment today is about $1.3 billion. Why, why is the endowment important? So in an environment where state support is dwindling and there's a bunch of other pr uh, pressures on higher education, um, we need a long -term, the long-term growth and health of the endowment uh, assets are key. Um, we're only 1%, uh, the pay, annual payout of 4% is about 1% of the operating budget today. But um, as we grow, the larger the endowment is, the larger the annual payout is, and the lower financial pressure on the university. So how do we do all this? Um, number one, um, fundraising is key. Uh, Nevin Kessler and the folks at the foundation have done a really nice job recently 
um, uh, fundraising uh, throughout the university. Uh, solid returns. Um, we think about returns in a 10, 20, 30 year uh, time frame and um, protecting uh, the downside or, or loss of capital. So we do that through diversification and investing in assets outside of just U.S. equities and, and treasuries. Um, we're invested across uh, uh, a, a number of different asset classes, which we'll get into later. So when we first came in, and this was actually in my, um, my presentation deck when I, when I interviewed, um, is creating an endowment office that's part of the fabric of the university. Um, people need to know what we're doing, and that's why I'm here today, and um, how we can help support uh, folks throughout America. Uh, like I said earlier, note we've never had an endowment office. People um, didn't really know what we were doing here, and our job is to change that through openness, collaboration, transparency, and um, those three uh, bullets on the bottom I think are really key. Um, we have to work with integrity uh, within the university and outside when we're dealing with uh, our counterparties, uh, flexibility and, and having an open mind and being humble and understanding that um, we, don't, uh, we don't know everything and there's always something new to learn. So a healthy endowment and superior fundraising lead to uh, a more comfortable financial position, but also uh, some of these bullets, fulfillment of the institutional mission, supporting sp specific programs, um, excelling in research to help solve global problems, um, and strengthening uh, economics and social state of, uh, of the state. So what are we trying to do at the, um, at the endowment to help besides management of assets? Um, so active management on the bottom, this kind of gets into some of the things we've done since we've joined here. Uh, we changed our asset allocation quite a bit and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, we've changed our consultant uh, to make it a little bit more uh, collaborative, and um, we, we're implementing processes and systems uh, from software to how we conduct due diligence when we're looking at investment managers um, to sourcing to, um, uh, to how we're coming up with, with our pipelines. But on top of that, uh, one of my real focuses is um, how do we help you know, how do we help students get jobs? How do we, um, how do we help, um, you know, the business school interact with some asset management firms on Wall Street? So Road to Wall Street was created before I got here, but I think it's a really, um, it's a really great program for a lot of, uh, for the school, because instead of Rutgers kids getting back office jobs on Wall Street, now we're trying to get into front office jobs. And um, I've tried to collaborate and, and, and work with the Road to Wall Street program, um, bringing on interns, but also um, introducing them to some other asset management firms that might look at interns, whether there are interns at the endowment or just folks at the business school or, or otherwise. Um, and also increasing transparency um, and taking down silos, working with the foundation much more on hey, this is what we're doing at the endowment. Let's work with, um, let, let us help you work with donors. Let us uh, help you work with your, uh, your development folks so they can have meaningful conversations um, with donors when they ask specific questions. And, the, and even sometimes getting on the phone with donors when they have really specific questions. So a little bit about our governance. Um, we re I, re I report to Mike, um, but uh, we report to the Joint Committee on Investments. The Joint Committee Chair is Talak Lal. Uh, he's a Board of Trustees member. He's also the Head of Risk at Franklin Templeton. Um, and our new consultant is FEG. Um, we moved to them in uh, April of last year. They are a small firm out of Cincinnati cater more towards endowments and foundations. And um, they're, they're a smaller group and a lot, uh, very collaborative. We kind of view them as another team member. What, what our consultant does is um, say we go out and 
we find an investment manager for a private equity space. They help us do due diligence, make references, and, um, and uh, uh, build pipelines. And oftentimes I'm on the phone with them once a day, if not more, asking them a question about this or, hey, what do you think about this? And we're kind of debating constantly about um, what, what we're going to be doing with the portfolio. Uh, our staff is myself and, as I mentioned, uh, Lou Kish. And um, we have committee meetings with the Joint Committee on Investments about uh, once a quarter. Sometimes we do that more often if, if an investment opportunity uh, pops up. So a little bit about endowment mechanics. Um, we're unitized. Uh, the long-term pool is unitized and, and operated like a mutual fund. Um, and shares are owned by those 2,500 different individual endowments. Um, the endowment buys shares of the long-term pool um, when we receive uh, those donations. And below, there's a little bit about the different types of endowments, so true, term, and, and quasi. And as we discussed before, one of the, if not the most important part of a very healthy endowment is fundraising and continuing to raise assets. Um, this, I stole this slide from the foundation. Um, this is all gifts, all fundraising, not just endowment fundraising, but it's really important and you can see the upward traje trajectory um, and, the, uh, and the tailwinds we've had with, uh, with Nevin um, under, under his leadership more recently, and I think uh, you know, with the with the campaign coming up, I think it's going to um, continue to a trend in that in the right direction. And if you, if this slide is our performance, so uh, a couple things. If you look, uh, people love to fall in love looking at fiscal year performance numbers because they, everybody thinks it's a football game. Um, what, how we do in our performance against Michigan or Michigan State or anybody else doesn't really matter. It's about, um, it's about achieving our goals and uh, growing, uh, handling that payout and growing for the long term. But if you want to look at benchmarks, we're nicely outperforming um, our peers and our, and our uh, target-weighted uh, asset allocation benchmark over three, five, and, and ten years. I think on the, o the only measure we're not outperforming is uh, on our peer benchmark over a billion, uh, funds over a billion uh, in the fiscal year. So um, have done a very nice job over the uh, last 10 years. More, and I can't take, unfortunately, I can't take credit for that. Do we have a question? Just wondering how we compare with our Big Ten peers as far as assets under management. Uh, I believe we're next to last. Um, I think Mar Maryland is the only. The, the question, if everybody couldn't hear, was how we compare to our Big Ten peers um, in assets. Um, Maryland is uh, right now below a, a little bit below our 1.3, and uh, everybody else is kind of stacked in that one and a half to three area. Um, the only outlier uh, is really um, uh, University of Michigan, which is around uh, 14, 15. But more importantly, um, we've been, been achieving our ultimate go goal of providing returns above our needs, um, which is the 4% annual payout every year um, and our expenses. So um, our support of the um, of the foundation's budget and also our expenses here at the to run the investment office um, and sometimes taken into uh, account inflation so if you think about if you think about it that way um, I just did this on the November performance numbers our 10-year performance number as of November was eight and a half percent annualized a um, if you if you added our 4.95%, so our payout plus the 95 basis points we pay to the foundation to help support their budget plus uh, inflation, that number is 6.7% versus our 8.5%. So um, 
we're handling our needs and we're and we're growing. And you can see on the bottom chart how our uh, that market value has grown um, through returns and fundraising over the last 18 years. Um, I like looking at this chart. I know um, we only account for 1% of the operating budget of the university um, with that annual payout of 4%. But this tells us a, a really good story, I think. Look, look at where we were in 2006 and, and look at where we are now. Um, next year, we're going to be close uh, close to $50 million, um, paying to help support the uh, the budget of the university and, and uh, paying out to all those individual endowments, which um, you know helps all those specific causes, but just um, lightens the load and, and reduces the uh, hopefully continues to uh, reduce the financial pressure on the university. So I talked about uh, this a little bit before. The endowment's primary purpose um, is achieving total return to fund that spending rate uh, plus inflation and costs. Um, and anything above that is uh, for gr long-term growth. You can see the components of the return need on the, on the left-hand side, um, which, which breaks out our, um, our spending rate, inflation, ex and expenses, which is about 7.3% if you include inflation um, in there. And on the right is what I kind of look, like, look at every day is uh, what's our asset allocation? You can see our asset allocation as of June 30th, 2017. You can also see it as of June 30th, 2018. Um, asset, the asset allocation helps to, uh, us to achieve the goals we're talking about here. Um, with, we do a lot of work behind the scenes in putting this together and figuring out what's the optimal portfolio and optimal assets to invest in to achieve those goals on a, re a risk adjusted basis. So um, we want to diversify, but we also want a portfolio that's going to have enough juice um, uh, and, and be able to uh, make returns that, um, that help us where we need to go. Um, and as you can see in June 30, 2018, and our, uh, on the right is our long-term um, asset allocation. That's where we're trying to get to we just changed that about two years ago. Um, we are getting a little bit more less liquid and um, trying to invest in more private asset classes. Um, historically, that's where um, the, uh, the best returns have been. And um, given the way the, the endowments portfolio has been invested previously, we think we can take on a little bit more of that liquidity risk. So how do we invest? Um, it was funny, uh, somebody brought this up earlier. Um, we don't pick stocks and bonds. That's not what we do. Um, you know, that's, nobody should ever hire me to do that. Um, but we pick investment managers. So we pick investment managers for US equities, for international equities, for private equity, for fixed income. We're out there uh, looking for the best investment managers in the world, um, whether they be in the U.S. or China or, or anywhere else. Um, and we're also trying to um, have our ear to the ground on uh, thinking about opportunities and new, investment, uh, new investments and new technologies that are going to help us achieve uh, our long-term goals for the next 20, 40, 50, 60 years. So, we're constantly out there talking to experts and saying, all right, well, what are you guys focused on? What do you think is a new trend? Um, and really trying to uh, have an open mind and be intellectually curious. Um, as I mentioned before, we're, we're focused on long-term performance, so not worried about those fiscal year numbers. Um, and we're constantly monitoring and evaluating the folks in our portfolio to see if we me need to make changes. Um, and it's really important, those bullets on the bottom, um, to be flexible, have an open mind, and uh, always be, you know, never dismissing ideas. Um, 
we, we need to be nimble and, uh, and act on, uh, on everything we see out there. Uh, here's the most, the primary contributor, uh, this was a study, and, and we use this in a lot of our investment committee material, um, just to kind of help people focus. Um, we need to have a plan, we need to execute, and we need to stick to it. Um, maintaining discipline and not getting uh, spooked when markets go down like they have been recently and then going back up. Um, the most important contributor to investment success is, the, is your asset allocation and sticking to it. And um, these decisions are long-term and impact long-term success. And um, that's kind of, that's what I think about every day when, you know, market goes down, you know, 3%, um, not, don't, don't get scared, don't worry about it. Sometimes people come and ask me, hey, did you see what the market did today? And I said, no, I didn't really even look at it. Um, <laughs> that's, that's not what we're focused on. Uh, just to drive that point home on asset allocation, um, we started using this recently in our investment committee stuff. I wouldn't worry about reading anything on that chart. Basically, all this chart is is every time in, since June, not every time, but um, market prognosticators you see on CNBC or elsewhere um, since 2012 to, uh, to today, uh, every time somebody came out and said, well, the world the world is falling apart and, um, and, and you should get out of equities and the market's gonna have a downturn. Um, as you can see, it's happened a lot. And if you were to listen to those folks, you probably would have missed out on making a lot of money. Um, the main point is you, we can't time the market um, and we're not gonna worry about trying to do that. And we're not gonna, um, we're not gonna get caught up in the, uh, in the euphoria of trying to listen to people kind of scare folks. We're gonna to stick to our asset allocation and we're gonna find uh, good managers and we're gonna find good opportunities and um, try not to be affected by all the other noise. And, and you know, another one on process. Um, it's all about process. It's all about uh, being long-term and it's all about having the right decision-making structure having the right reporting structure, having a good committee in place, and um, sh going to the committee. We do a lot of work behind the scenes on our consultant puts together a memo, but we also do uh, our own investment memo. We do, uh, we visit all of our managers um, at their offices multiple times. We do references on, um, uh, with prior CEOs of companies they've owned, um, existing CEOs of company they, they've owned, um, uh, existing investors, uh, ex-investors, um, anybody and any, anyone who can tell us something about those folks because we're making um, big decisions with university assets um, and we're, um, we, don't for, we never forget that. So I like, uh, I like using the chart on the bottom because I think it's kind of funny, but it, it's also, uh, it's also very true, and um, we need to, once again, constantly remind ourselves we need to have a, uh, a good process and a plan and, and, and maintain it. Kind of reminds me of, uh, I'm not a New England Patriots fan, but uh, it, it's kind of sticking to the Bill Belichick mantra of how to do things. <laughs> I don't, that's never been substantiated, has it? <laughs> um, and then uh, we're going to wrap up soon. Next slide. A little bit more about what we've been focused on uh, more of late. As I mentioned, we've been fo focused more on illiquid asset classes, um, trying to kind of harvest those, uh, those returns. Those have been the best returning asset classes. Uh, specifically private equity. And um, you can see on this chart, um, this, this chart is basically on the, on the right-hand side where venture capital is. That's the dispersion in a uh, top quartile manager, return dispersion between a top quartile manager and a bottom quartile manager. There's a lot of room for error um, when you're conducting due diligence and when you're picking the right folks to invest with. Um, 
those were that's also where the best returns are. So that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time, making sure we pick the right managers in that those areas. Um, there's a lot of debate right now about active versus passive on U.S. stocks. You know, just give it to Vanguard or pick a pick a manager that you know historically has done well um, uh, picking assets. Even if you pick a great manager, the returns, the dispersion of returns don't really add up. You don't really want to spend your time, uh, spend your time there. You're better off, not that we do this, we're a little bit more balanced, but you're better off, uh, you know, indexing it to a certain point um, and spending more time elsewhere. And lastly, um, you know, this is about having a disciplined process, being transparent and clear communication with all the stakeholders across the university, um, trying to help the foundation, trying to help the business school being here today, uh, and really uh, communicating what, what we're doing and being open to questions uh, as well, and having a long-term and flex flexible approach. Um, if we do that, um, we'll probably do a nice job of, of attaining those ultimate goals of um, having the best risk adjusted returns, uh, having an institutionally sound investment office, um, having a great culture, and uh, po contributing positively to the uh, university at large. So with that, I'll leave it open to questions before I turn it. Yeah, are there any questions in either room or uh, along from the web? Okay. I want to thank uh, Jason. Uh, this, uh, our, our whole investment function has really matured since he has been here. And, and it's become, it's gone from being what I call the uh, old style um, committee consultant process to one where it is it is professional best practice um, and uh, disciplined long term uh, as you as you know transparent and particularly um, thrilled about the impact on individual students interns who come through the program and and others who who get to hear about the uh, long term investment function from when uh, Jason goes speak to uh, the groups about that and the interaction with the uh, foundation. So uh, if there are any other questions, please put them in the chat or uh, we'll have the Q general Q&A at the end. So now turn it over to Ernie DeSandro. We'll talk about the uh, data analytics and reporting methods. Hello. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jason. Uh, those of you who know me from previous uh, town halls know that I'm an Eagles fan. Uh, that was me yelling out the, that Belichick was a cheater. Sorry about that. Um, no, but we're, we're really, we're really, um, you know, I feel pretty privileged to uh, work with Jason, and I know that uh, in the in the couple years that I got to work with him, um, he's a very humble person. But um, you know, we should all remember he came to us managing a $20 billion portfolio investment from uh, the state of New Jersey. Uh, he's also a Rutgers alum. So, um, you know, thanks a lot for that. I think as we're moving in these uh, town halls to be more transparent, more sharing of information, I think this kind of presentation is something that you can always refer back to. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, so I'm actually excited to um, talk a little bit about uh, the finance data and reporting and analytics project. Um, and while I'm real excited to get to the punchline, I think it's important for us to understand how we got to where we are. Um, going from uh, this slide depicts really our evolution of the project. Um, going from when we went live with uh, Oracle Financials in October of 16, um, where we had a bunch of reports around the FRS or Financial Reporting Studio, the Oracle Transactional Business Intelligence, BI Publisher. And so 
we still had that inventory of reports, but we knew that we needed better reporting. And, and somewhere in that March timeframe of 17, we launched the Oracle Reporting Initiative Project, Enhanced Reporting Initiative Project, excuse me, where we went out to the field and got folks uh, from the units and the campuses and asked them to be part of um, making a better reporting platform. And we had some really good deliverables coming out of that, uh, starting with um, a reports rationalization, uh, where we deleted a lot of reports that were duplicative that were out there. And then we also created that go-to list of reports um, that we can then reference. Um, about a year ago, we launched our Cornerstone Reporting Optimization Project. And we spent a lot of time assessing um, and coming up with what the current state of reporting was and how that was going to marry up with what our future state, where we wanted to go. Um, and of course, uh, that gap of where we were to where we wanted to go provided sort of uh, a roadmap for how we were going to get there. And in June, we launched our implementation. And a big part of the Cornerstone Reporting Optimization Project implementation was just standing up um, you know, an operating model that would be able to support uh, reporting going forward or the future of reporting for the university. Um, and that included identifying our stakeholders, identifying a training strategy, and then for the first time, uh, really looking at using the Tableau enterprise uh, architecture that uh, is used for, throughout the university um, and then applying that to our needs. And so a few months ago in September, we launched our finance data uh, analytics and reporting project really to drill down on how we were going to use uh, Tableau in, in the short term and, and in the long term uh, based on those requirements. So the slide does kind of go through all of uh, you know, the evolution, uh, but I do think that this is just the next chapter of where we're heading in reporting. It's not, uh, it doesn't end there. Um, there will be things that we're going to uh, uncover as a result of doing the reporting that will lead us to um, uh, make different decisions and I think that's really our operating model uh, will support that. Now the other thing that's important although this presentation will speak specifically about our Tableau work that we're launching um, it's also important to understand that we're not getting rid of all the other reporting tools that we had um, and that this is just another tool uh, in our tool belt. Right, And so um, I'm excited about it. Um, there's some new terminology that we're going to be throwing out uh, as it relates to Tableau, uh, namely some of the self-service analytics. For the first time, we'll, we'll give people the ability uh, to run their own analytics, as well as having the ability of doing some managed reporting. Okay. Now, as I talked before, you know, our implementation phase and throughout this whole process, um, we have tried to engage with the units and with the campuses and people throughout the, the campuses. Um, over the past uh, three or four months as we were working through um, this project, we, tr we hit over 170 people throughout the campuses across about 11 workshops. And we've defined and we gathered the requirements, I should say, uh, for over 400 user-defined requirements. And, and those requirements um, basically summarize into the releases that you see represented in the rows here. Um, one of the neat things about Tableau is that uh, it enables us to pull data from different data sources or different subject areas. And so as we were gathering requirements for things like payroll and al analytics, for example, uh, we knew that we had to hit the general ledger or sponsor projects um, and non-sponsor projects, but that also we were going to have to interface with our HR system or payroll system. Um, and this particular chart really does demonstrate, um, you know, across all of the different releases, what uh, subject areas we intend to hit. So it's pretty encompassing, um, all-encompassing, and it's, again, based off of the requirements that we gathered uh, through the workshops and by uh, talking to people out in the field. <clears throat> I have to get these buttons going the right way here. 
Um, in terms of what it looks like, this is just a representation. Now, there are a few things in the early releases that we actually did go live with. Um, some of the general ledger, uh, legacy general ledger, or the legacy RU general ledger, uh, payroll and tuition redistribution reports, as well as expense report analytics that we rolled out um, earlier this year in release one. And then uh, mostly based off of uh, some of the more immediate uh, uh, deliverables, uh, we did launch and we, we just completed the Tableau Discoverer Finance Report replacement as well as um, the sponsor project report. And the sponsor project report here is really to help units uh, reconcile from the project subledger into the general ledger. And you can see how the, uh, you know, we're, we're starting payroll analytics next. Really the, the order and the prioritization of these work streams and the timeline, really, that's what we're trying to um, demonstrate in this slide is that it's not a big bang approach. This will take time. Um, the order of the releases will depend upon our priorities and upon you know, what the field tells us. Um, and, and we'll be able to you know, adapt accordingly. Also, uh, what you'll see is that there is some overlap. We don't have to wait for one work stream to finish before we start another work stream. Um, and so, so that is a, is a depiction of how we intend to roll out these releases. Now, I think it was would be, it would have been um, it was important to kind of make sure that I get everybody in the field as excited as I am about what we're showing. And so, um, the next couple slides really do demonstrate uh, some examples of how we intend to use Tableau. Now, this particular report, and I, I guess. Um, looks like any other report that you would see. However, if you were to draw a, a horizontal line a roughly halfway through the page here, um, what you'll see is a depiction of two data sources. The, the top data source is our general ledger board of governors reporting revenue. This is 30A, or what we report for sponsor projects um, to our, our stakeholders uh, coming directly out of the general ledger. Now, this is um, organized by natural account. And then the columns to the, to the right represent what comes from, and you can see the grand total of $2.6 million, comes from a, f a couple of data sources, one being the project accounting uh, subledger, and then another journal entry source key uh, that, that's basically a journal entry that was made for $50,000 in this particular case. And then the bottom half, of the screen here is the data that's coming from the project subledger. And we just connected the dots just really to kind of show that what's being reported in the general ledger, that source from the project subledger, is the same as what we're showing down below in the project subledger. This provides us kind of a jumping off point so that we can then do some further analysis. But, you know, before we, before, um, we do that drill down, we wanted to make sure that we tied back to what was being reported in the general ledger. So one of the neat things about Tableau is that it has the ability to show us two different data sources on the same page. The other is that on the right-hand side, we have some filtering capabilities, some drill down capabilities as well um, that we'll also be able to utilize. Okay, so we made the connection of this, you know, making sure that what's um, in the project subledger uh, represents and it ties back to what was reported in the general ledger. Now we'll use Tableau to actually drill down on that revenue number of $2.8 million. Okay. Now, this is a, a pilot, right? So we have, uh, we have a lot of folks out uh, in the field and at the vice chancellor rep area who have helped us put this together. Uh, but we've summarized the revenue, uh, direct expense, uh, F&A expense, and then a surplus deficit column um, by project number and then by contract number. And we've also added some demographics, like what the bill plan or the bill method is, so that um, although we took a snapshot of a report, this would be inception to date activity. So there's a lot of um, numbers or rows here with zeros. That's just because they had data in 17 or 18. 
Um, but if you go down to the first few rows that have data here, uh, you'll see a cost reimbursable project where the revenue and the costs are equal. That's what you would expect to see and that there is no surplus and deficit. Okay, There's, uh, this is providing the analysis that we want our users and our department heads to be able to then drill down and then point out to us certain areas or uh, to use this for their variance explanations as we are looking at what grant and contracts revenue are doing. A couple lines down, you see some fixed fee where we have apparently spent some money uh, without actually meeting the deliverable, where we've had some approval to, where we've ha had some authorization to begin working on a project, uh, but we haven't quite met the deliverable uh, that it has enabled us to, to not write, to not create the revenue there. Um, this is also a place where if you see something wrong, you can say something, and you, you know you can then instead of um, you know saying my data is incorrect, you can say my data in project number X. Um, looks like it's a little bit off. Do we have an issue with the budget? Is there something else behind uh, what's being calculated here? And again, I think you know our evolution here uh, has gotten us to the place where we can really use this as a tool to drill down on on revenue. And this is just an example. Uh, but we've added a couple extra filters here. You can filter on pro project or contract number, uh, project number, et cetera. Now these are two examples of some tabs of how we're trying to make the connection between the general ledger and the project subledger. And again, uh, they're a little, you know, they look like any other kind of spreadsheet. Um, but that's, if we were to stop there, I think, um, you know, I wanted to also get you excited about what we can do. And there's a visual representation um, that's probably a little more appealing. What we can do uh, with a tool like Tableau is to provide you know, more visually appealing reporting and more intuitive kind of reporting. Um, and that, that starts with something like this, which is our expense analysis dashboard. Um, the, the top actually has different tabs. So we're looking at by uh, type, by creator, but we can look at it by traveler. We can look at it by UDO, um, uh, by UD or by month. Um, and we can look at it, uh, there's three different um, uh, representations of the same data, but one but looking at it by type, travel, lodging, uh, travel, air, domestic, et cetera. We ha can look at it uh, by who created uh, the name. Uh, in this case, the names are all um, hidden uh, to protect the innocent. Um, uh, and then over to the right, we have a tree map, which is uh, basically there's two views of that same tree map. One is by unit and one is by division. Um, and that we can see that, you know, in order of magnitude that the School of Arts and Sciences makes up the biggest part of, um, of this expense and, and so on by unit and then by division, um, 6295. As you get down into all of these different squares and, you know, if we're looking at a PowerPoint presentation, but if we were live in the system, if you were hovering over those amounts, there would be pop-up boxes that would have the entire uh, description and things like that um, in there. And, and the other thing that we've added to the right is that there are different flavors. There's a legend, you know, the color uh, optimization, as well as having different, you know, check boxes, a little more user-friendly environment to present our data uh, on the outset. Uh, so those are just a few examples of uh, some of the reports and how we're using the reports that are coming out of this next phase. Um, of our chapter. Um, let's take a look at where, what we've done so far. So our outreach from an outreach and collaboration standpoint, we've got about a, over 150 people um, enrolled in the Tableau Finance Reporting. 300 of them are trained and able to do ad hoc analysis. Um, there's about 650 people who are using the Tableau Discover Finance Report, um, as well as 575 people that we trained uh, most recently in five different webinars, mostly on the Discoverer to Tableau uh, replacement. Again, that's the finance piece of Discoverer to Tableau. Um, some of the data sources where we've actually connected to, aside from the cloud and the uh, legacy general ledger, 
Uh, we're also using the tuition redistribution and the payroll distribution are areas that we're hitting. Um, and we, as I said, we have, we have plans to go across multiple uh, subject areas. We've created 70 different reports that have been created by users across the university. Um, there's about 67 uh, reports that are uh, part of the Discoverer Finance. And because Tableau is an enterprise tool, and we know that we have users throughout the university who are further advanced in the tool, um, we actually have an area in our communications and marketing group that has leveraged some of the reports that we've put out there and combined it with their own third data so that they can create their own reports. It's a real, um, real, real advantage to be able to take data that we know is scrubbed and, and ties and, and has some foundation and then enable that to the university so that they can leverage that data for their own uh, purposes. So real, real um, excited about that as well. Uh, uh, in terms of our next steps, uh, we will be doing more training. So initially we have some additional webinars that are focused on our Discover to Tableau reporting, but we will have additional training for the self-service analytics, that advanced topics, if you will, uh, around training. There will be, always be some basic training um, reporting, and, and to a certain extent, we'd like to use the units uh, out there, so we will try to have a um, train-the-trainer approach uh, for the campus unit levels as well. Our sponsor project and GL data analytics piece um, is some training that we're going to be rolling out very shortly um, as we move from pilot into the expanded use. And, and really, it's not so much about the Tableau training that we're, we're concerned about. It's the function of what happens when you see a difference. How do I actually um, tackle and, and get to the root cause of, of what's, what I'm seeing in the general ledger or the project subledger? That would take a little more time. And then, as I said before, we're starting with our payroll analytics piece, uh, just gathering the requirement sessions with the different subject matter experts. Now, um, as I conclude, you know, it's important to understand that this, again, is part of our evolution. It's where we're at. Um, we have, um, you know, I, we have a lot of people to thank from our executive sponsors, and both Mike Gower and Michelle Noor and our executive sponsors, as well as uh, from a collaboration standpoint, we have you know, it's really a collaboration between our IT group and Ellen Law, our PMO office, um, head by John Fahey, and then, um, and then the finance representatives, which we all play a part of. Um, but then also all of our representatives from the units, the campuses, the, the central business managers who have been uh, along for the ride, um, very much want to thank you um, for the help that ultimately created this area. And within the controller's office, we have our finance data analytics and reporting team, um, what we affectionately know as DART. Um, that team is directed by Betsy Cafiero. Um, and on, on her team, uh, the senior manager, Nitesh Ganesan, uh, who is responsible for all of our uh, reporting here, and then um, providing us some uh, expertise around not just project management, but also best practices around Tableau. Uh, Dave Valtinas is here uh, to help us with that. But our resources page, we have a new uh, reporting website, which all of this information is here. Um, questions and feedback uh, can be provided um, to those areas there. I will take a break for questions. I know we do have one from Yes, the, the question is, will Discover no longer be available? Um, eventually, Discover will no longer be available. Um, we are trying to be very deliberate. Um, there's a lot of things outside of finance that people use Discover report, uh, Discover for. Um, we, but it is, it has been sunset. It's not our, uh, it's not our decision. It's an Oracle uh, decision that Discover is no longer being supported. Our intention is to phase everything from Discover into something like Tableau or, or something else. Uh, but we won't 
get rid of it before we have a suitable replacement. Questions from New Brunswick? There are no questions. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ernie. This, um, this particular project has come a long way in a relatively short period of time and was one of the uh, big issues as we were bringing up the system. Um, so it made up a lot of ground very quickly and it is a foundational thing for future work that we'll be doing, um, not, not just continue work in the financial area, but as we get into the other uh, new systems and new data sources. And there, there is work that's going on, albeit uh, slower than Michelle and I would like, that relative to overall analytic structure and, and philosophy um, and program here. But the uh, confluence of, of the work coming from uh, Cornerstone and the, the, the kind of almost uh, uh, advantageous accidental adoption of Tableau across the enterprise uh, has, has been a real benefit given that there are uh, a lot of distributed users who really had uh, expertise in this and, and allowed for a, a good uh, co uh, consolidation into a tool uh, along with the tools that came from Oracle. And um, I should note at a, at a recent meeting of, of uh, R1 schools that I was at, uh, that seems to be a, a, a trend um, in terms of the use of Tableau as a as an enterprise tool. Uh, it's something that, as I talk to peers at other um, major research universities, it, it's becoming that, that kind of thing. It's not, not for everything that we need. We need other sorts of things as well, but it certainly works for a lot of that. So now I wanna open up uh, to anybody on either side or um, on the web for any, any general questions, um, whether they be about systems, finance activities, um, anything other than uh, predicting the results of the Ohio State game on Wednesday, which I will not do. Anything coming in? As usual, we will be posting this um, uh, video to our, the website uh, later today or tomorrow and would welcome questions uh, following up on it at any time. Uh, you can always uh, send questions to finance at rutgers.edu. That's the, uh, our general um, email site. Uh, every email is, is reviewed and addressed or moved to the right place for a response. Um, and of course, in regards to this, uh, particular effort, the reporting at finance.ruckers.edu is the, is the site. Okay, well, we'll, we'll call it a day then. So uh, thanks for the Jason and Ernie for presenting today and uh, thanks to all of you who are either watching or will watch when you see the, the video of this later. So have a good afternoon. <laughs>